Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day to anyone that, uh, that celebrates, and uh, a happy Session 9 <laughs> for everyone that's on board. So uh, welcome to uh, the ninth session um, in the Certificate Program in Practice-Based Research Methods. Uh, today's session is called Quality Improvement Research Alliances and Methods for Practice Improvement. Um, as always, the session is facilitated by the Clinical Directors Network and the N Squared a Network of Virtual Training Series funded by the AHRQ. Uh, this gives you live access to um, the webinars and also archived access to the sessions. Um, this is all a part of the certificate program in practice-based research methods uh, developed in partnership with the support of eight AHRQs uh, funded by the PBRN Centers of Excellence and Dr. Jim Warner. Um, as always, if you have any questions or technical difficulties, please double-click on Clinical Directors Network or CDN Help or tap, uh, type within the chat box. At this time, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Warner, who is going to introduce our speakers for today. OK, great. Thank you, Vladimir. Um, so our topic for today is um, quality improvement research. And our speakers, our presenters, are Dr. Chet Fox and Dr. Mary Delansky. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce both of them to you. Uh, Dr. Chet Fox is Professor of Family Medicine and Biomedical Informatics at the University of Buffalo. Uh, since 2001, uh, Dr. Fox has been Director of the Upstate New York Patient Powered and Practice-Based Research Network, known as UniNet. Chet conducts debt dissemination and implementation research that specializes in transforming evidence into practice. He is currently Principal Investigator on a large NIH trial that uses health information technology and computer decision support to improve the recognition, recognition and treatment of chronic kidney disease. And uh, Dr. Fox is one of the really prominent national leaders in practice-based research, so we're very fortunate to have him with us today. Dr. Mary Delansky is an associate professor at the School of Nursing at Case Western Reserve University. She is director of the Interprofessional Education in Integration, of Interprofessional in Education Integration, excuse me, for the Center of Excellence in Primary Care. And she mentors pre- and postdoctoral nurses in the VA Quality Scholars Program, which is a national program that has um, a node in, in the Cleveland area. Dr. Delansky serves on the Association of American Medical Colleges Teaching for Quality National Committee and um, to, in and to integrate quality improvement in medical education. She co-leads the development of the free massive open online course entitled Take the Lead on Quality Improvement in Healthcare, which you may want to check out. Uh, finally, Dr. Delansky is also a fellow, one of our fellows in the certificate program in practice-based research methods. And it seemed like um, a, a good natural fit for her to um, co-lead this, uh, this seminar. Uh, because she has complementary skills and expertise uh, with Dr. Chet Fox. So um, Chet and Mary, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, OK. Oh, wait. He did show me how to do that. OK. Basically, the, the talk is about utilizing quality improvement for practice space in the practice space research networks. and. Uh, when I got started on practice-based research network, uh, I was appointed by my chair as the director of the network. And my attitude was, that's fine. What's a, what's a practice-based research network? But after going to a number of convocations and NAPCRAG and other things, I found that clinicians weren't necessarily interested in the randomized controlled trial. But the clinicians in our area were very interested in how do we improve care at the doctor's office level. So we've done a lot of studies on how do we improve care with asthma. Hello? With asthma, diabetes, um, with others there. I guess there are some people coming on. And, and other things. So that was called in the early, mid-2000s, translating research into practice. But then evidence-based medicine came in, so 
we just started calling it translating evidence into practice. I'm going to give you the 30,000 foot overview on the intersection of quality improvement and research. And Mary is going to start giving sort of the nuts and bolts of how to actually use quality improvement in research. So when I started doing this, uh, I said to my colleagues, uh, I'm doing quality improvement research. And they looked at me and they said, there's no such thing as quality improvement research. I go, yes, there is. But when I said quality improvement research, I swear they looked at me like I had one eye squarely in the middle of my forehead. And the basic definition I have of quality improvement research is quality improvement projects that are done with scientific rigor, just like any other scientific experiment, uh, that's what makes it research. Um, so like I said, I'm going to start at the 30,000 foot level. And, and go from there. And first, we're going to start with the conceptual model. This came out of uh, Puget Health, Group Health, uh, or sometimes called the Wagner model, because Ed Wagner developed it. And it's been an extremely useful conceptual model, and has all all my work has been focused on it. It's it's been in all my grants. You see the the two big bubbles, the health system bubble and the community bubble, and then you know what resources they have. And, and then you see the two important things, the pre prepared proactive practice team and the informed activated patient, productive interactions. This conceptual model, and when I put a grant or a project together, I can often say, OK, this is what I'm working on. You know, so for example, my CKD study is working with clinical information systems, decision support, and prepared proactive practice teams. It's not really, even though there's some self-management in there, that's sort of the heart of what I'm doing. So I can usually map what, what the project is, or if it's a public health thing that we're doing, you know, we look at the community or patient voices network and informed active patients. So this is the conceptual model. Yeah, um, Fox, um, just make sure everyone has their phone on mute, and also, Dr. Fox, make sure that your computer is on silent. I know you're using the phone line, so make sure your computer is muted, um, that no sound is coming out. I just get a little, um, I'm getting a little feedback. Uh, all right. Yes. Okay. Is that, is that better? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I didn't think about muting the computer. So basically, a lot of the things that we're doing, as opposed to the random, I, I divide research into answering some of the famous journalist type questions, you know, the who, what, when, where, why uh, kind of things. But randomized controlled trials are very good at answering the what questions. And they're very good at answering what, you know, Will beta blockers prevent second heart attacks? Or will controlling diabetes better prevent something? Will anticoagulation prevent stroke? So it tells us sort of what to do. So randomized controlled trials are really important for generating the evidence. But for disseminating and implementing evidence, uh, we need to do the how. How do we get that done? How do we uh, make this uh, part of clinical practice. So for that, uh, there's something that, and NIH is moving to this, called the pragmatic clinical trial. So it's basically improving care in the real world. So it, there are four principles of the pragmatic clinical trial. And you'll see at the bottom, for those of you who are interested, I gave the reference to look at the seminal paper on pragmatic clinical trials, which was by uh, Dr. Tunis and Carolyn Clancy, who was head of AHRQ for a long period of time. So it, it, it basically comparative effectiveness. You're looking at clinically relevant alternatives. Now, often the alternatives or control may be, usually care, may be usual care. That is an alternative. That there's a diverse study population uh, that it occurs in multiple pr different kinds of practice settings, large groups, small groups, uh, you know, Et cetera, and the data is collected on a broad range of outcomes. 
you can see how this is very different than the randomized controlled trial. So, why do we need this kind of study? Well, basically, the, the best evidence shows that people get only 50% of evidence-based preventive and chronic kidney disease care. Now, for each of these, I also gave the references of, you know, so that you can look those up. Second is the Duke School of Public Health did two really nifty studies asking ourselves the questions, do we have time to do all the evidence that's there? So maybe evidence-based care isn't occurring because there isn't enough time in the day to get it all done. And that's what they found. They took the A and B evidence of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and they put a time uh, on how long it took to do it. And just to do A and B evidence on the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, and this was 10 years ago, this doesn't count whatever they've added, uh, it would take 7 point hours 7.9 hours per patient per year just to do the screenings. To do chronic disease management, it would take an additional three and a half to ten and a half hours <laughs> uh, per day per patient population to do all the chronic disease management depending on whether if the patients were all stable, it would take three and a half hours a day. If the patients were unstable or complicated, it would take ten and a half hours a day as you're all well aware, as you're trying to arrange for specialty appointments, look at what referrals, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it, the well-known quote that it takes 17 years from the time there's evidence in the literature for it to become uh, routine care. The, I don't know how you want to do this, but in terms of questions, what we can do is if you have a clarifying question, Please feel free to interrupt me. I'll stop before we um, go to, uh, and then Mary will do the same thing, and at the end we'll have time to hopefully interact, but this should not take the full time for us to present next. Uh, Look, Chet, um, I'll just jump in a sec. We have a chat box in the lower left uh, hand part of the screen that, are, that the fellows generally will type their questions into, and then uh, so that you don't have to keep monitoring that, I'll jump in and let you know when there's a question there, if that's okay with you. That would be fine. Thanks, okay. Jim. Sure. So here's the, um, the model for improvement. This is the basic principles of quality improvement. And you see where it goes from investigation to demonstration to implementation. But the important thing, you know, it, it's what are we trying to accomplish, how do we know we've accomplished it, and what changes do we need to make. So all this is, is a, a lot of it is common sense in terms of doing this. And this also has stood the test of time in terms of the, the rapid PDSA cycle. So the idea is to build on the PDSA cycles, but I want you to look at where that break is that little blue triangle that's holding the PDSA cycles. And I think this is a critical statement. Unless changes are integrated into daily work, the changes will not stick. Uh, so basically, we're trying to create changes that will become uh, routine care. An example of that is, you know, we're now, almost all of us are doing e-prescribing. We don't need to have a model for improvement on e-prescribing at this point because most or all of us are doing it. Uh, well, having done this and having tried to improve practices over a very long period of time, we found, I think, in the PBRN world that there are, there are four modalities that really work well. And one is practice facilitation. The other is academic detailing slash mentoring. And I'll describe the difference between academic detailing and academic mentoring, audit and feedback in terms of being data driven, and collaborative such as what we're doing today. Yeah. So first, um, practice, so some definitions. Practice facilitation, and this is off the ARC book, you know, the, the the four sort of uh, 
of the compass is, is facilitating interpersonal skills, use of data, optimization of health IT, and QI and change management and knowledge transfer methods. But what is a practice facilitator supposed to do? They develop long-term relationships with the practice. They work integ integrally with the practice to set up efficient systems for QI and population health. They train staff in team meetings. They help set up work, uh, efficient workflows. They prepare necessary data for reports. And they cross-pollinate ideas that work across multiple practices. Academic detailing is where an experienced um, clinician champions educate practice champions. Sometimes you need practice buy-in. And sometimes a friend of mine says it this way. It's not the message, it's the messenger. So you need champions to talk. Um, you need doctor champions to talk to doctors. But we found that you really need champions at all levels of a practice. You need front office. You need office manager champions to talk to other office managers. And you need front office champions uh, to talk to other front office people. And you need uh, you know, clinical clinicians and nurses and office assistants to be able to get buy-in uh, for others. Academic mentoring is something we, we developed in our last NIH grant. And it was more than just, here are the guidelines, go do it and leave. We set up a monthly call with each of our lead clinicians within the practice, within the study, and an expert. It was a, a kidney disease study, so it was myself and a nephrologist, and we divided up the practices. And we, called the, we talked to them once a month. We reviewed their data. We asked them how things were going. We were often talking about secular trends and how they fit. Oh, your practice is joining an ACO. Or your practice is becoming direct primary care. How does that affect your ability to do the quality improvement? And the purpose is buy-in. Um, so it's really to, uh, to support efficiency within the practice instead of what the practice looks at when we come to them with a research or quality improvement or what I call the dreaded one more thing. Please don't tell me to do one more thing, even if it only takes 10 or 15 seconds. Please take things off my plate. Don't put them on. Audit and feedback we do in two forms. On an individual measure, you can look at pre-post change over time. So let, let's say that that could be blood pressure control. What percent of your population is with blood pressure control? So you can do quarterly reports so you get a nice little bar graph of what you're doing by individual measure. And then you can look at benchmarking. This report was really well received. So your, your practice is in red. All the other practices, and it doesn't have to be practices, can be individual clinicians. However you want to break the data. So we usually try and feedback both kinds of reports. We find practices and uh, clinicians are very data driven. That the first thing we do with data is when we present it, we say, this is the data we've gotten from the EMR. First question we always ask, is the data real? You know, Look at your gut. Be honest with yourself. Does this look like it's real data? Because a lot of times there may be some errors in how we pulled the data or some, or we haven't pulled the data properly. But if we first get agreement with the practice that this is their data, and then once, once they realize it's their data and they're looking at it, it, it usually is very activating on them wanting to do something to help move uh, the numbers. The other advantage of the benchmarking report and audit and feedback, for example, on the far left you see the two practices that are at 75% plus. It's a way to identify exemplars to look for best practices. So it's also a way to highlight them within the study. This group got 80% blood pressure control or 90% recognition of kidney disease. And this is how they did it. So it's a way not to be a report card, good or bad. It's a way to help find exemplars to find ideas that can be shared, which is the next topic. Why is it my My thing's not moving. Oh, there it is. Thank you. 
collaborative learning. Collaborative learning it, per, to, today is a, a perfect example of collaborative learning. It's what the clinical directors network specializes in. But collaborative learning can take many forms. It can be uh, video. It can be in person. It can be webinar, small group, uh, practice managers. Uh, it can be specialized. And it can be synchronous. And I didn't have this on the slide. It can be synchronous or asynchronous. It can be things like listservs or social media or other things like that. I guess the reason I didn't put that is I'm not very good at social media, but it doesn't mean that it can't be a very useful uh, sort of tool for learning. Next slide, please. Okay. So what are the key elements of success? And there, there are six or seven things. You need clear goals. You need the resources, the data, the clinical champions, you need a site coordinator for local accountability, and you need shared learning abilities. Um, so the goals obviously need to be clear, measurable, and feasible, and not too many, not too few. You know, if you have too many goals, you have no goals, and if you have people can't work on a thousand things at once. Um, you need the resources. You need the time and personnel to do the project. You need administrative buy-in. Whoever controls the resources. We've worked with some hospital clinics that say, yeah, we want to be part of the study, but oh no, I'm not going to let a nurse go to a quality meeting when she should be putting patients in rooms. <laughs> I'm not going to release my office staff to actually have a team meeting. I think that's starting to get better uh, in terms of shared learning abilities. There are principles for building workflows. This is a complicated slide. Uh, so one of the things that you can do is just you need to work together with the healthcare system, the patient, the diagnosis, and, and move about. And building workflows is a very important part of the things we do. Okay. So I want to go from the theoretical to an overview of our pragmatic clinical trial that we did in chronic kidney disease. This was a comparative effectiveness trial, and it compared computer decision support alone. All the practices already had some point of care uh, computer decision support. They just didn't have chronic kidney disease as part of it. So we just added it to their IT with either uh, no training, no knowledge. You know, you're using decision tool. You now have some new alerts. See what happens. Versus doing a a full uh, uh, a facilitation, and it was a national study, so we did a virtual facilitation. We we did the uh, facilitation by webinar with our practice facilitators. Here's an example of what the computer decision support would look like, and what I want you to pay attention to is in, in the middle. So this is basically, this got printed out uh, every day for the practice. And it's now been advanced, so that it's now a, a web-based tool. So in multiple EMRs, they, they were able to search the database and extract the data um, no matter where it was. So um, for example, when we we're in all scripts, and when we looked for hemoglobin A1C, our database manager found it in 28 different tables, all of which he had to merge into a single table for us to find out what hemoglobin A1C values were. This was a middleware program that did all that for us, and then digested the data. And on digesting the data, put an evidence-based algorithm on top of it and gave a patient profile to the doctor. So if you look. At the right-hand column, third one down, action items. So that's something with you know, document this, order a mammogram, uh, schedule a Pap smear, etc. But it also had the patient's last labs, their last immunizations, and other things. So it was useful. Uh, it was a useful digest of the patient, you know, while they were in the office, and could be used as a communication tool. So. That was what was available to everybody. Chronic kidney disease was added. And we used a framework that was developed by Kevin Peterson and the University of Minnesota folks on their diabetes improvement that we adapted uh, the framework 
to to facilitate decision support. And the framework was called as the mnemonic translate. You know, what are the targets goal setting? Is there a point of care reminder system? Is there administrative buy-in to the people who control the resources? Are there networked information systems? Can you get the data in registry form and for population health? Uh, is there a site coordinator, a local champion, audit feedback, a team approach, and education? And the study outcome measures were the evidence-based outcomes for kidney disease, controlling blood pressure, glucose, uh, LDL, use of ACE and R, referral to nephrologist stage four, uh, eliminate smoking, and um, eliminate non-steroidals because they're toxic to people with bad kidneys. Our preliminary results, we were in 35 practices in 10 states, had 21,105 patients. That we had data available for three years. We only had, we're, we just got out of the field, so we only have preliminary pre-post data, and the diagnosis of CKD improved from 34 to 44 percent. The use of ASR uh, improved from 46 to 51, and the referral to nephrology went up from 29 to 34 percent. We'll know statistical and clinical significance when we have the comparison to the control data. The preliminary first cut looking at the data, it looks like there was marked increased awareness in CKD. The one practice we had doubled it and, and increased use of ACE and ARCs, which would be a nice outcome for the study. Uh, in terms of dissemination, we had six peer-reviewed publications. That's now seven. We just had another one accepted. We had 20 national uh, presentations. And the, trans the, the translate scoring framework that we used as this model for practice transformation, CMS adopted in their 685 million uh, transforming clinical practice initiative. And they actually credit uh, both Kevin Peterson and UniNet with the framework. So I, I was pleased that CMS did that. So a small brag or boast there. The, um, we did some qualitative, it was a mixed method study. So we did some qualitative study. We did surveys, physician interviews, uh, we analyzed the communications between the facilitators. We did a translated scoring rubric. We were scheduled to do site visits, but we got hit by the sequester. So that got eliminated from the grant. So here were some of the physician themes that we learned from the qualitative side. There is limited awareness of evidence-based CKD guidelines. There is inconsistency in CKD screening and diabetes diagnostic process, um, use of health information management systems for other diseases. Uh, you know, they had guidelines. It, it, we found a lot of difficulty. People were very uncomfortable um, with CKD and explaining it to their patients and their uh, challenges with multiple comorbidities. A lot of these are obviously not surprising, but I'm a big believer in mixed methods kinds of studies. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mary to talk about the nuts and bolts of utilizing QI. Mary, it's all yours. All right. Thanks, Dr. Fox. <clears throat> I enjoyed uh, your presentation. I thought um, you brought out some of the change strategies that are evidence-based in improvement, in quality improvement. And you talked about the practice facilitation, the academic detailing, the audit and feedback, and collaborative learning. So I think that... Um, quality improvement is moving from a sort of a local operations method to a science method in that we are developing evidence to show what's working and what's not. So I think the, the, the piece I really wanted to have you go home with today is, you know, what is the difference um, between quality improvement and improvement science? So I think Dr. Fox demonstrated to you how improvement methods can be utilized in a science uh, methodology with rigor um, and looking at what's really working in improvement. Um, and that uh, is in contrast to like quality improvement that we're doing at the local level where we're, we're making improvements as we um, uh, work in our practices. So that's the objective of my section. So before I get into the rest, 
if you can just use the chat box if, and type in what you believe are dimensions of quality. And if you already have the slides, then I guess you have the answers. But I don't know, if you could just put some ideas into, you know, what do you define as quality in your work in, in your clinical practices? So I don't see anybody sticking anything in yet. I'll give you a few minutes. There we go. Okay, consistency. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Evidence-based. Great. Uh-huh. Good outcomes. Uh-huh. I thought it was important that we talk about what is quality because this talk today is on quality improvements. So I think we must know what really quality is. Relationship to accepted guidelines efficiency. Okay, great. So you've got uh, quite a few of them. So the Institute of Medicine actually defined quality through six aims. And the first is that care should be safe. So that's one of our measures of quality. Patient-centered. That's uh, so someone wrote in patient-centered. That's actually the sixth. Um, the IOM also said that care should be effective, so evidence-based, somebody brought that up, and that efficient, so it should be timely. Um, the fourth is that uh, in quality means timely care, patient-centered, and then equitable, that disparities in care should not be eradicated. So actually, if you are targeting any of these quality indicators, you, you know, and trying to improve them, you're doing quality improvement. And that leads us to, well, what really is quality improvement? And Batalden is actually one of the founders of this movement of quality improvement. And he defined it as the combined and unceasing efforts of really everyone. Our healthcare professionals, that's us. Our patients, they need to be involved in this game. The families, researchers. The researchers can provide us evidence for what are the important features for improving care. Payers, planners, educators really to make changes that will lead to better patient outcomes, better system performance, and then better professional development. Um, and I think it is important to think of this, that we're all in this game and that uh, we all play a part in quality. So I, I know a lot of you are younger, but this quality movement has not been in existence very long. So it really is only about 30 years old. It started back in manufacturing. That's why we see a lot of controversy with quality improvement methods, people saying, well, we can't apply what was done in manufacturing to healthcare because healthcare is so different and dynamic. Um, however, I think the last 30 years have, have shown and demonstrated that there are pieces of this model, of this quality improvement model from manufacturing that have been helpful for us. Um, and then I think one of the first quality improvement projects was with asthma back in 1993. Um, and then the the link then was to uh, link improvement and change and learning so that um, a continuous learning at the front line is the key. And to summarize what quality improvement is, it's systematic and it's data driven. So it always requires looking at data. And it always includes a dynamic intervention. So that means that we try something and see, did that work? Well, maybe not. Let's do it a little differently next time. So the intervention that is being applied is constantly being improved and changed. That is very different than traditional research. Um, and the, the purpose of QI is to bring immediate improvement to a local context. Um, and I want to share that I really have, through my 20 years of teaching this, have come to the understanding that it is dimensional. So quality improvement is a philosophy. And it also involves some tools and methods that we can use to make local improvements. And then now it is really evolving as a science. So a little bit more on these dimensions, particularly with the philosophy. So I believe that in order to truly make improvement at the local level and could be a factor that could be studied in the future, is this culture of a learning organization where people are constantly looking at their data, finding out where the gaps in care are, where evidence-based practice is not being initiated or where there's errors in care, and that the practitioners, the frontline staff, are constantly thinking, how can we do it better next time? Um, so that is a little bit about the philosophy. Um, I'll get into a little bit more about the next dimensions later. 
Um, I also want to state that the whole foundation of quality improvement is, is in models. So Dr. Fox shared with us the model for improvement, which where you identify an area for improvement, you propose specific changes, and then you test these changes, um, and you do these multiple cycles of improvement. But as you can see on the right side of the slide, there are other models that you may have heard of in quality improvement. And these include Six Sigma, um, Lean, um, and then the Duran model for improvement. And all of them really are kind of doing the same thing, as you'll see in, in a minute. The other piece that's very important to remember with quality improvement is that there's these four main dimensions that are um, essential to doing improvement work. And the first is that you have to really understand the system. Um, because many times when we want to make improvement, we jump to, well, let's just try this, because we think that is going to be the answer. But we've learned in improvement, in quality improvement, that it really requires people to really understand what are all the dimensions that are occurring in order to find uh, an improvement strategy that will really be effective. The second dimension of improvement knowledge is variation or data. So in all improvement and quality improvement, you have to have continual data to feed you with what is happening in that system. The third dimension that is essential is the knowledge of psychology. You have to have some type of knowledge in how to change things, how to get um, you know, people to adopt and do things differently. Um, and Chet did talk a lot about those change strategies um, and methods, such as practice facilitation and academic detailing. Um, and then the last dimension is this theory of knowledge, or these plan, do, study, acts, where people are continually like testing little experiments, seeing if they work, and if they don't, then trying something different. So uh, back to those dimensions I was referring to before, and the first dimension of philosophy of culture, and I did describe that in a little bit more detail um, a little earlier. Um, I do think that that is an essential feature, that we have to be sort of taking on this philosophy of learning and improving at a personal level. Um, and if you don't have that in an organization, it's really hard to make change that sticks and sustains. Um, the other piece about this philosophy is that if you're in an organization that has this kind of philosophy, these organizations are really doing great work. So if you look at Cincinnati Children's or um, Intermountain Health, if you go into those organizations, they have this culture of people believing these things. Even, they say, the uh, janitors and the housekeeping even go to work to improve the care for the patient. Uh, if we look at that second dimension of improvement, which are the tools in this local level, there are these sort of um, tools that we can use in improvement. I'm sure you're all aware of fishbone diagrams to help you to understand the system. Um, so if an error is made, like a wrong dose medication, you can look at all the factors in that system that led to that error to help you to understand where there is a potential for improvement. And then a second tool that is essential in improvement are control charts and run charts, where you look at your data over time to really understand patterns and where changes are becoming effective. Um, and then the third component of these tools that we use are these change management or change innovation strategies. So you know, there's been a lot of research on education as a change strategy. Um, there's been research on reminders, the champion model, that audit and feedback, and the collaborative. These are all things that Dr. Fox had brought up recently that are pieces that are important for us to use as tools in making local improvement. Um, and then this fourth tool that you can use to make local improvement using quality improvement methods is that model for improvement that Dr. Fox brought up earlier, this theory of knowledge generation, doing something and testing the changes over time so that you finally refine these interventions so that they finally do stick. I know if you've tried these methods, this is sometimes the way it feels. Um, it's not always linear, it's not always pretty, and it's usually pretty complex and tangled up. Um, but the evidence does show that through determination and continued effort in this continual learning that uh, improvement does succeed. I just wanted to share with you some products of local level quality improvement initiatives. So in our Center of Excellence in the VA in primary care, we are teaching medical residents, nurse practitioner residents, and social work pharmacy and behavioral, behavioral health in the medical home model. 
and we have all of our residents do per inter uh, professional QI projects, and all of them submit abstracts to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and they all present a storyboard. So these are just some examples of storyboards um, from our residents. These are the products of local quality improvement in which the purpose is to improve care in your local institution. Also, there are these wonderful SQUIRE guidelines to help people doing local improvements to publish. Um, quality improvement projects need to go through institutional review boards in your organizations. They are usually determined to be exempt. Um, and then you can publish your work using these SQUIRE guidelines that have been recently updated um, and improved, actually. Um, and then I've left an example in here of one of our uh, uh, scholars in the VA Quality Scholars Program who then did quality improvement work in our VA and then did publish his work. Um, just as an example of the products deliverables with local quality improvement efforts. Okay, so back to that uh, slide that I've showed three or four times now, that QI can be a philosophy. It can also be a practical problem-solving tool at the local level. Um, now I'd like to move to the quality improvement being an application of a theory-driven science um, or a, a science of a system of change. So now we move into the research avenue. So this is really new. Uh, 2010 was about the first time I've seen um, some improvement science in, in the literature in sort of nursing. Um, in medicine, it sounds like, Dr. Fox, you were kind of, uh, medicine was ahead of the game in it kind of improvement science. But this improvement science research network started um, as an AHRQ grant. It was a, a funded center that was a, determined to be a field of research focused on healthcare improvement. And the primary goal of the field was to determine which improvement strategies work um, as we strive to assure effective and safe patient care. The center is still in existence, and what they do is they do multi-site studies in, in usually inpatient, um, sort of like PBRN in the clinics, uh, where they're testing uh, different strategies to um, sustain improvement in inpatient care. Um, and here's that slide again that I uh, talked about from that Batalden and Stoltz article, as you can see, from 1993. I know it's very old, but this is the foundation of this whole area of inquiry, um, improvement science. And even in our science of improvement, we really have to understand the system and we have to use data in very uh, unique ways. So the statistical process control really becomes a key factor in this. Um, and opportunities exist in science just to test different types of change strategies, what works and what doesn't work. So if we look at the science now, looking at Im improvement science, there are models then to help us to understand the system. Um, one of these models is the theoretical domains framework. And what it is from Dr. Mitchie, she's from the UK, and they have identified through um, I think the summary and synthesis of 60 different change theories, what are the facilitators and barriers that then lead to successful um, implementation? Um, so this is one of the theories that has recently evolved in improvement science. Um, another uh, piece that has evolved is we developed um, some measurement. So because this is a new field of inquiry, there are not a lot of tools to measure the concepts that we're trying to shift. So at Case Western Reserve, we developed this system thinking scale so that we could measure um, the impact of having quality improvement teams really think about the system to see if that then would correlate with success of their improvement efforts. Um, and in science, a key to the um, reporting in improvement science are control charts. There are statistical processes. Uh, that are the foundation for this effective way to demonstrate a uh, change, a uh, significant change over time versus the pre-post. So we're moving toward this use of statistics. Um, and then as uh, we talked uh, uh, quite frequently in this discussion about the um, change strategies that can be used in improvement, um, the ones that we have been mentioning have been education, reminders, champion model, um, I just want to go over the evidence on some of these change strategies. 
So we do know there is evidence to show that education has little or no effect on improvement. So in our center of excellence with our residents, when they do their systematic review of what are the issues related to, you know, why that um, there's a gap in care, usually the first thing they identify is that there needs to be education. So the point that I'm making is that education is necessary, but is never the essential link to success and improvement. Um, they found in systematic reviews that these change strategies are somewhat effective, audit and feedback, local opinion leaders, local consensus processes, and patient-mediated interventions. So we're building the science in improvement um, on looking at these systematic reviews, what's working, what's not. These change strategies have been found generally effective, um, reminders, uh, interactive educational meetings, and multifaceted interventions usually are the most effective. And therefore, as you all read in the literature, these bundles. So we do know that bundling interventions usually is effective. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share with the science of how we're trying to integrate some quality improvement tools in science is in that last um, dimension of improvement, the theory of knowledge, where we're, we're doing small experiments or PDSAs. Um, well, now we have the research designs that help us with that. So there are now the smart design and the adaptive interventions where actually you build this in your proposal and you um, a priori say that if this intervention doesn't work the first time, then the next time we're going to do it this way. So you can a priori hypothesize that if the intervention doesn't work, then it will be done differently the next time, and uh, these designs are um, listed here. Uh, and I found another very interesting application of quality improvement in a recent publication um, by one of my colleagues, Heather Tubbs Cooley from Cincinnati Children's Hospital, where she actually proposed and got funded for a three-phase trial uh, where the, the first phase was actually um, getting information from the um, patients. There should be they do pediatric research. And then the next study was actually doing PDSAs. Uh, in order to refine their intervention. And then the third phase was actually studying the RCT. So they went, the study went from qualitative in phase one to quality improvement, kind of refining the intervention, phase two in, in real uh, clinical care, and then the RCT in phase three. So I thought that was another neat application of improvement uh, in improvement science. So I think in general, this is a very exciting time in our healthcare because we are moving from traditional um, pre-post RCTs to other very innovative ways to um, study the phenomenon of improvement and change. And I shared with you this article by Dr. Berwick. Um, in I know it's from 2005, like change is slow. <laughs> um, and he described in there this merit trial where the um, they were looking at rapid response teams across the world. Um, and uh, you all know what rapid response teams are. And they just seem so logically advantageous that if we would send a team into a patient who was declining, that then the team could help to reverse the, uh, you know, the, the consequences so the patient, you know, would not arrest and we could reverse it so that then the patient, you know, would survive. But they tested this in an RCT with a pre-post kind of design, and they concluded, you know, that, hey, look, you know, these rapid response teams really don't work. Um, but as we, we took this information in improvement science, we really looked at, you know, well, what was missing here? Why did they not find a significant effect? And what they found was that they did not really measure these contextual factors what was going on in these sites that were in the intervention group and what was going on in the sites that weren't? And well, you know what they found was that some of the sites in the, in the control group were actually implementing rapid response teams. And in the sites that were supposed to be in, implementing them, they weren't. So there was big gaps in fidelity. So uh, Don Berwick, in, the, uh, in one of his keynote addresses to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, concluded that we really need to move to uh, different forms of, the, of research and design, particularly related to realist evaluations, uh, which they talked about in this, where we're looking at the context and the mechanism um, in order to make conclusions about outcomes. 
Um, I also included for all of you this really important article that was um, published by my colleague Greg Ogrink out of Dartmouth, and uh, they really the article really helps us and gives us a tool to differentiate what is clinical research and then what is quality improvement. And if you did look at the article, this was one of, I think, the key um, visuals. I like pictures. And the, the visual here is that we can, we can sort of look at the uh, quality improvement on a continuum. So if you start here at the right, you know, it's direct patient care. We're delivering care. Then we can improve our care, as uh, we talked about this today, on the local level. So we can use quality improvement tools looking at the system, looking at the data, trying change strategies and doing little cycles of experiments to see what's working, what's not working. So at the local level, we can then do improvement strategies. And then we can move more to the left, where we can start to now do some improvement research, where we can look at across multiple settings and multiple sites, you know, what's working in one site and not in the other site. And in quality improvement research, we can also, you know, start at the qualitative component. We look at, um, you know, sort of like um, qualitative um, information about the different sites and then go all the way to quantitative. And I think as Dr. Fox mentioned, a lot has to do with the rigor as to how we are vigilantly studying these concepts. Um, and then the, the uh, article then moves to the left where you are purely looking at research where you're doing sort of control trials of um, comparing uh, specific interventions with other interventions to find out which one of these interventions are the key to sustained improvement. Okay. So I know last month we talked um, the content the content was implementation science. and. I've been um, sort of reflecting on this quite a bit the last two years um, and intrigued by it. Implementation science, the um, DNI, the Dissemination Implementation Science Conference, has been around for about eight years now or nine years. And um, they are really moving very fast with models and measurement and um, how do we implement evidence into practice. And I do think that these different areas of science are very similar. Um, and I do think there is some overlap, probably bigger than that the visual has right there. But I think this is something that we're going to have to think about as we evolve forward in our advancing in science in improvement. Um, I just wanted you to be aware of some of the organizations that are key. I'm sure you all know about IHI. Um, but the other one that is um, um, for scholars or science is the Academy for Healthcare Improvement. Um, it used to be the science component of the IHI, and then they broke off, I think, three years ago. Um, it's a very small organization, but their conferences are sponsored by the AHRQ, and they deliver very high-level um, information on different designs, such as uh, these adaptive designs, um, advanced statistical tests, such as time series, cluster randomized, hybrid designs. Um, and I would, it's very reasonable to join, and it is a great conference for the science component of improvement. Um, Cincinnati Children's Leadership um, run this organization. And then I mentioned the Improvement Science Research Network was interprofessional, but does have a very high nursing um, sort of focus. Um, so in summary, what I, uh, my attempt was to help you to see that there is um, differences between quality improvement and improvement science um, to understand, you know, what is quality, what are we trying to improve, and then what is quality improvement. Um, and I hope that you under, uh, understood that this uh, improvement movement includes sort of a philosophy, a local contextual improvement um, in the purest form of operations kind of quality improvement, and then we evolve to the science where we're really trying to understand what are the components and products or specific contextual factors about organizations that will lead to improvement, which can be improvement in you know, implementing evidence into practice or improving safety, improving efficiency, effectiveness, uh, patient-centeredness, equitable care, and, um, uh, and the like. So luckily, uh, we're done uh, at a good time where we can open up the chat box, or if people want to ask questions, uh, then Dr. Fox and I would be here to 
answer any questions. Okay, great. Thank you both very much. Um, our first question is for, from uh, Min Yang. Uh, can you share some tips in monitoring and controlling contamination in quality improvement research comparing an intervention to usual care? Uh, yeah, I'll take that. The, the, we, we often do this as a cluster randomized trial so that it, the, the unit of randomization is at the practice level rather than the patient level. But we did run into this problem uh, in our larger study because the practices were in the same organization, so there was contamination across the organization. So we, we almost had to randomize at the organization level. So there, there are sort of three levels. You know, there's the patient level. If you randomize there, you're going to get contamination in the study. You can randomize at the practice level, then you have to look to see where they are. There's another form of contamination which I don't think is possible to control for, but is important to measure for. And what I, what I call there is social contextual factors. So for example, if you're doing a study to improve diabetes care, and then uh, the local insurance company says, if you get X number of patients with hemoglobin A1C below 7, we're going to pay you a lot more money, then everyone in that community is going to start doing things. So there are secular trends uh, that, that need to be controlled for. And whereas we can't necessarily control for that in the individual organization, we're thinking about creating a third arm in our study which just measures people that aren't part of the study just looking for secular trends in the area. Yes, and I'll, I would just add that, as Dr. Fox was explaining, you really have to be carefully monitoring the context. And sometimes in the application of these, like, you know, uh, practical trials, <laughs> you're in the context. So it's hard to always control it, but you have to measure it. So that's the qualitative component of this. Um, and it is better articulated in the realist evaluation where, you know, that the focus of it is really measuring those contextual differences because they could be the key to why something works and why something doesn't. Okay, great. Uh, good question and, and uh, really great responses to that too. Um, next is from Tamer Saeed. His question is in the chat box at the lower left. How would you describe the difference between quality improvement from quality improvement research? And if we are looking at outcomes, does this not mean that QI is part of research? Okay, so there there have been quite a few articles written about the differences between QI and research and improvement research. And I can actually send them to Dr. Rohr and they can put them on the website. But I think if, very briefly, uh, quality improvement is a local initiative to, you know, make change at the local level. Um, and improvement research is really to understand what's working, you know, when. So it's more of the discovery phase of, and more of the, um, um, you know, uh, discovery and looking at the um, efficacy of our, of our implementation strategies. Um, and that's um, from my perspective. But I know, Dr. Fox, you may have another perspective on those differences. Well, I, I think what I, I, there's a good article, and I think we added it to you by Kevin Peterson and Jim Moles about the intersection of quality improvement and research. I think it's what's considered a reasonable answer. Quality improvement gives you a pre-post change in a single setting. That is a scientific result. So, some, so that in some senses it's a scientific experiment. But for evidence without a control group or without knowing why that's occurring, uh, it's, it's viewed as just a QI project. So I view the difference as having some sort of that that the QI is the method of the research. The quality improvement task that's being done is, is the intervention that's occurring within the research, but you have to compare 
you, you have to compare what's being done in its individual office with a similar office or offices to to make it work. So the idea is we randomize the practice level. You can't just do that with one or two practices. The studies become large because your N now is the practice site. So you can compare one with the other. So you need some sort of comparison group and contemporaneous time to move it from what I would call a quality improvement project to quality improvement research. Yeah, I really like that, um, Chet, in that it's sort of the rigor of the of the evaluation of it, um, and that both do produce important knowledge and important evidence for us. However, um, I think a lot has to do with the rigor of the design and the control uh, issues. And probably measurement also, right? What are you measuring? Um, because possibly in a more rigorous design, um, you'd be maybe looking at fidelity a lot closer um, than in um, in improvement at a local level. Well, it is difficult because a lot of times in quality improvement research, there's a lot of freedom on the part of the actors. It's not a protocol. It, they, they, some people may want to call the patient up every day. Some people may want to use nurses. Some people may want to use PharmDs. So there's, you're not looking to say to create sort of new things, but are there methods or principles that that work? I'm part of an NIH collaboratory, and the. Um, there are some RCT research assistants that are when we're doing we're doing an intervention in four different ACOs with multiple comorbidity and allowing the practices to decide how they want to intervene. The goals are the same, but the methods vary a little, so it's different than an RCT and it's not necessarily protocolized how to make the improvement, just that they are making the efforts at improvement and then it's important to study how. Mm -hmm. Which, um, Roger, do you want to state that question? Because I think it's an excellent one. Roger had something in the chat box. Yeah, some folks that are not uh, okay. don't have uh, audio well, control. So I well, think this was in response to you about your contamination uh, question response, Chet. Yeah. Roger said, doesn't that kind of suggest a need for consistent mixed methods elements of design? I think it's really difficult to do quality improvement research or implementation research without mixed methods. I, I think it's absolutely critical to the designs and, and very rich in terms of what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Okay. Yes. Great. Um, I hope I didn't cut you off there, Mary. Did you have anything else to add to that? Okay. okay. All right. Our next question is from Jinping. How about uh, IRB requirements for QI research? Can you publish QI project results without IRB approval? The, it depends on how your, your particular IRB views the term exempt. Um, basically, when, when there are QI uh, results, we present it to the IRB and saying, here's the aggregated data of what we're going to publish of a QI project that we did. So the QI project itself was not research. The publication of it is, uh, whenever we've asked the IRB, they, they have given that to us as exempt. Our university says that we have to get, say to them, uh, here's what we're doing, and then they come back and then they judge it as exempt, and then they send an email back to us that says this is exempt. So we can put in the paper this this research was judged to be not human subjects research by our IRB. Right, and we did in the VA Quality Scholars Program about three years ago. We did a survey nationally in the VA system to find out what was the consistency in this. What should we tell people to do? And it was very interesting. Every IRB was different. And so what we concluded then and what we recommend is that everybody then submit to the IRB the protocol and then let them decide. And then as Dr. Fox mentioned, usually they say it's exempt. Mm -hmm. 
it, it, it usually we didn't even necessarily even have to submit the protocol. Uh, I actually had a lot of discussions many years ago with our social science uh, IRB about this because I was medical director of a Medicaid managed care program for people with mental health and substance abuse. And we were required by law to do five quality improvement projects per year. And I said to them, if some of these projects show something that's significant and publishable, I don't want to have to get five uh, protocols approved up front. And what he and I sort of agreed to, which was a good principle of some, if it's some, if it's a, if it was a QI project that I was going to do anyway, whether they, whether I was going to publish it or not, then that was not research. When I was going to publish it or evaluate it, that was the research. So the IRB is about publishing an existing, existing data that's aggregate. So they were they were going to have no control of what I was going to do because I was going to do the QI anyway, and that's sort of the principle I've used. If this is something that I would be doing as routine clinical care, you know, and you know, not as part of as part of the experiment, then then I didn't get the IRB to do the QI project. I only got the IRB if I felt I wanted to publish it. In answer to your question, yes, it is possible to publish uh, QI results. In fact, I had a medical student project with a fourth-year medical student who did a research elective with me, and it was on recognition and treatment of chronic kidney disease. Even though we talk about the re-aim model, uh, you know, reach, effectiveness, adoption, implementation, and maintenance, there are very few articles published on maintenance because there's very little funding for maintenance studies. So it made for a nice project for her to go back into the practices that we found our initial results in and to see if they maintained their gains. So she did that and found, um, you know, it's nice when the data falls nicely that the, the gain, some of the gains had slipped but they maintained a statistically significant increase over baseline. And we were able to publish that and there are journals of quality improvement. So yes, you can publish quality improvement results even if they're quality improvement projects. Mm -hmm. And then don't forget to use those Squire guidelines to and state that you will that you use the Squire guidelines in your publications. They're just like the consort guidelines. They the journal editors are aware of them and know and are looking for your use of them in your publications. Yeah. And it looks okay. like Jim asked a question. You wanna? Yeah. Um, uh, I'm just wondering, Mary. Uh, I was very curious about the work at the VA because you have such diverse teams there represented um, trying to all kind of work towards uh, one goal of improving quality. And what are the challenges in that kind of environment of, of achieving, you know, quality improvement? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really great question because with, in all of my um, educational curriculum for QI, I've always included teamwork and collaboration because I do believe that in addition to using the tools that we've talked about, the System, you know how to how to understand the system, how to you know to understand data using control charts. Um, it also is imperative people work in teams. So my experience in interprofessional teams has has led me to this this conclusion that in order to work effectively in an interprofessional team, you have to always seek the views of others and always share your view. Now that seems simple and easy and it's words. However, in the in the delivery of that is very difficult and that's because it takes time to seek the views of others. So what we see in our interprofessional quality improvement projects is that the, the disciplines don't take the time to understand the other disciplines perspective. They just think like they know and that they're just going to do it and it's so much faster if they just do it themselves rather than get everyone's perspective. And if we think about healthcare, that's sort of what we do in healthcare, right? We sort of, you know, think that our discipline knows and we're just going to do it and not really seek the views of all the other disciplines. So the biggest challenge then in our success in QI at the VA with these teams is really getting them to sit down and really hear the views of all the other disciplines. And once they do that, they really see the, 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 
the synergy and the, uh, the imperative nature of that exercise. Because unless you understand everyone's perspective, you really can't do effective improvement work. Um, and one other example um, was we had a team of um, medical residents who were, who were very interested in um, improving vaccine rates. And so they jumped past the understanding of the system and they jumped right to the intervention. And so they determined that what they should do is just have the LPNs um, at the beginning of the visit do an assessment and then, you know, deliver the vaccines. And so they went to the, L the nursing group and they told the LPNs that this is what they were going to have them do. And um, it met with a lot of uh, resistance because the LPNs had a lot of information about why that wouldn't work. Um, and so it was, it was great that we let that evolve because then um, the team could see that in this work of improvement, you have to really, again, hear the views of others and then share your views and then come to some type of a conclusion or, you know, negotiate then, you know, what is the uh, conclusion. So that, uh, that's a key in this success. Just a quick follow-up question to that. Are, are the I, health professions... Jim, Jim, I had a quick comment about that. The sure, go ahead. It, it's sort of evolving from, you know, practice facilitation and others. The, the building of the team is, is sometimes the critical success element. And there seems... I think the next frontier is applying sort of team science principles and being able to study some of the quality improvement work from the lens of team science. That's a great idea. I love that. Yeah, uh, so um, do you guys uh, see that uh, the health professions are training people during their training programs um, to be able to do this kind of work adequately, or is it not until they really are in, in practice every day that they're actually exposed to, to the need to collaborate as, as interprofessional teams. I don't think it's even occurring there. <laughs> so uh, well, I, think I, I think it's happening more and more. Uh, you know, in my training and the training of most doctors, there, you know, there's, there's less information about quality improvement than there is even about nutrition. Um, it, there aren't a lot of lectures or programs or other things that go on, and there's very little about population health. So I think there's a marked um, deficit in the educational. And in terms of interprofessional education, I think part of that is also communication between specialists and primary care. We view the world very differently. Uh, so when I'm in a room with an endocrinologist or a diabetologist, uh, we're definitely talking a different language and need to learn to get on the same page. Yeah. That's a really good point, that even intraprofessionally, there's still the need to really hear the views of others. <laughs> yeah. And I would like to just share that. There is a big interprofessional education movement in uh, pre-licensure education and even post-masters and residency programs. There's a new, you know, Center for Interprofessional Education, the Nexus Center, that's funded through Macy, AHRQ, um, the John A. Hartford that has uh, big money in Minnesota. And then um, um, there's, you know, more um, reports coming out from the Institute of Medicine of Health Professions Education um, and the imperative to have um, health professionals graduate with the skills to be collaborative ready. So that's the terminology they're using. Um, so that we can change um, the, the, uh, the communication and the collaboration because we know that 70% of medical errors are due to poor communication and collaboration. So I think that the outcomes are driving the education and we are um, improving um, educational, interprofessional um, intervention, in, in, educational innovations in education. So that's exciting. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Tamar Seed. In case a uh, suggested in QI intervention does not lead to an improvement in outcome, does this mean that it is not a QI? And if 
and would it it follow would it follow if the same rules would it follow the same rules for publication? Excuse me. Hmm. Uh, no, I think that any time we fail, that's uh, that is important to publish too because we know what's not working. Um, and the other component to the question is that even if it failed the first time, um, it would be important to try it in a little different way the next time. So that continual learning is the key in improvement. So even though at the first round it didn't work, what can you do differently the next time to see if it might work? So um, that process needs to be um, um, enhan uh, enhanced in the, using the, mo the methods of improvement. And it would be publishable. So, yeah, yeah, but it'd be harder to publish it. It's it's easier to publish and improve. It, it actually somewhat depends also on the bias of the publication. If you did a good complementary alternative medicine study on homeopathy and showed it didn't work, they'll be glad to publish it for you. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, so, so part of it's a publication uh, bias. I would agree. It doesn't change the fact that if you did it with with scientific rigor that it is still science. Uh, the the ability to publish is a separate you know, is a separate uh, question. But it's interesting, uh -huh. Life Solberg was was the Lifetime Achievement Award at the North American Primary Care Research Group. And a good number of his studies failed. You know, but the lessons learned were critical to moving uh, the science of, of practice change forward. So they, they don't, you know, it, it was very impressive. I guess he was old enough to admit how much he had failed in his studies on, on, on how many of his studies did not work out well. And that, that is often, you know, that can often be the case. You can learn a lot from things that don't work as much as you can from things that work. Mm -hmm. And I think in the article that you had the group read, uh, the Balasam Brambanian um, and Cohen article that was an implementation science on the learning evaluation model, it did talk about this and did talk about um, you know publishing the lessons learned component of it. Um, but I agree that um, you know in in traditional science it's very difficult to publish you know null results. But th this is. We're, we're moving into a different sort of um, of um, inquiry currently, and um, I think that uh, there's there's new there's going to be the evolution of new new um, rules. I think in this, and that I think as we take on this improvement framework of continually trying to improve and see what's working and what's not, I think that you know we have to come through with. Uh, publishing some of these things that are not working so that we can learn and, and do what is working. So it's a great uh, response. I do um, think there's you know, interest in that. I, I think the question is not whether the, the study worked or not. The question is does it add to our knowledge? Um, and you don't necessarily even have to publish the results. Sometimes it's about publishing uh, the, the methods that worked and didn't work. So a method may have worked really well within a study, even if the outcome didn't change. So for example, on our feedback, our academic mentoring was relatively new, but we've gotten very positive feedback on that. So that's because then publishable on something can copy, you know. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. And then I think uh, Min Yang asked if uh, education is not effective change strategy, did we refer to physician education or patient education? And I was referring to, um, well, the evidence just demonstrates education, but um, it's both, actually. If, if you're trying to implement um, uh, evidence into practice, so, you know, some new vaccine into practice, and you do uh, an assessment of your staff, physicians, providers, and you find that they don't even know about this new vaccine, then, you know, the education you have to provide them is important. You have to tell them, here's what the vaccine does, and here's how it will improve your patient's outcomes. But the, the, the evidence tells us that that's not enough, that you have to do 
um, more implementation strategies to get that to, to stick and to sustain. And you can see that even with patient education, right? So we can teach our patients all about diabetes care and heart failure care, but just telling them what they need to do, we know doesn't work because, you know, rehospitalization rates are 20% for heart failure patients. You know, there's a lot of evidence that just educating people isn't enough. Does that help to clarify that, Min? And, and, and I would agree on, on changes. We found that it was never one factor alone that we needed to, to do most of, most or all of those four. You know, we needed the practice facilitation. The practice facilitation doesn't work well if you don't have data. You know, and audit and feedback didn't work well if people weren't looking at the data. And, you know, so, so we found that it, 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 we just naturally evolved to doing multiple uh, in multiple modalities, at least three, if not four of them. Hmm, that's a really good point, I think, Chet. That the evidence does demonstrate that that is m most effective is bundling them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really interesting stuff, um, Mary. I was really. Uh, uh, intrigued by the grant that you and Shirley Moore got on uh, systems thinking. I think you were, were talking about that around slide 49 and 50. And wonder, could you tell us a little bit more about that and uh, what you were able to learn from that work? Right. So um, I think that we were observing that people who do improvement work and who are successful seem to have this this ability to think beyond just delivery of care to, you know, individual patients and to be able to think of the whole system. And so we started reading Senge's work and um, others' work, and we had this um, sort of hypothesis that we think that if people can system think, then we think they're going to be more successful in their quality improvement um, efforts. And as you recall from the slides, Batal didn't have systems understanding as the first dimension of improvement work. So uh, we thought we can contribute to the advancement of improvement science by developing a measure to do that. And so the measure's been, you know, used through, throughout the world. There's only been maybe three or four publications with its use. Peter Pronovos did actually use it in uh, demonstrating um, um, the effectiveness of residents training in improvement on uh, systems thinking. So through the training of the residents in improvement work, that their systems thinking did increase. Um, so that is a limitation of you know new new disciplines is that there's not always uh, read, readily available um, tools to measure the phenomenon. So it, you know it was our first uh, go. But how we developed the items was through expert um, panels um, across the world and uh, using the literature to support what would be the dimensions of systems thinking and. Um, if anybody's interested, you could just Google it. The handbook is online with the items. And, and what is that called? What would we Google to find that? Oh, uh, system thinking scale. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I can. Uh, I have so many questions. I can keep going, but <laughs> we have a few more minutes, so I am going to go ahead and indulge myself here. So, Chet, um, I was really interested in uh, your patient-specific report for CKD, the point of care report. And um, I'm curious, how was that provided to the, you know, at the point of care to the provider? Was that through the electronic health record? And to what extent did, did you find that providers actually use that with patients? Um, the, the, the way that had worked. This was a middleware tool that pulled the data from the EMR, and, and at the stage that it was at, basically they would take the, the schedule from the night before and print out like four in the afternoon all those reports on all the patients that would be seen the next day. So it, it became sort of a paper tool within the office, which was really sort of interesting because some of the practices really liked the idea that it wasn't a reminder, an alert system in the EMR, but a piece of paper that could be passed around between 
the uh, MOA and the doctor and other things. And we had it in our office for a little while, and I used it as a communication tool so that when we made changes on their medicines, I wrote it out and gave it to the patient as sort of a summary of care at the end of the day uh, so that they would have uh, it. It was used differently by different practices. Um, most of them were using it on a fairly consistent basis because they found it to, to be very useful. Um, and some were doing it where the MLA would just highlight what needed to be done, you know, like, you know, needs mammogram. So they would take a highlighter and just sort of circle needs mammogram and then the doctor would order it. Others actually gave their staff permission, you know, to do it as understanding orders. And that varied from practice to practice. But the uptake of it was, they, they, there was already pretty good uptake of the use of it before we got into the, you know, before we got into the study because, you know, we, we were doing it, we were adding CKD onto what they were already doing. Um, if you're implementing it in a practice, like in our practice, it has all the, the problems of uh, workflow and other things that you have to integrate it into the workflow and have the meetings and other things. So it's, it's not automatic uh, without some training and facilitation to get people to start using it if they're not using it initially. Okay, interesting. It looks like it was really uh, information rich. There was a lot there um, that, uh, you know, and, and, and interesting that different practices used it in different ways, but that it was it was pretty highly utilized overall as well. Yeah, and they now, they now have it so that they have either the paper version or a web version so that they could toggle, you know, from the EMR. Ideally, you know, this is what EMR should have been doing for us, you know, period. You know, there's nothing, nothing new. It's just that the EMR vendors have not really done a good job extracting the data that already exists within their own EMR. Yeah, agreed. Okay, um, I think uh, we're having people exit the room because they've got to go to patient care and, and other things. So um, it's about time to wrap it up. And Mary and Chet, do you have any final comments uh, that you would like to, to make before we end today? We do have one more question that just popped in. We have about three minutes. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask the question, and then if you guys want to uh, provide any other comments, uh, please just go ahead. So Taim or Saeed is saying, uh, time restraints are a major issue in primary care. How do you, can you deliver the conversation to, pay to participants without them thinking of, ex of the extra tasks burden? Right, that's a really important component that um, in an implementation strategy that you can uh, add it to a task they're already doing or take away a task um, or find out the value statement from those uh, stakeholders. You know, so what's important to them? How do they feel this will improve the care they're delivering or how will they make this job easier? Those are really important questions to ask uh, for an effective, you know, change strategy. Good point, excellent point. Yeah, I, I think the question hit the nail on the head. Before we, on our PBRN, before we present anything to the practice, we have to get the value statement uh, from, you know, how, how is this more valuable? And a lot of times in our grants, we're providing extra help to do it. You know, we're paying for a practice facilitator or something else so that even though there's extra work, we're providing some extra help with the hope and thought that other things like, for example, we help practices get to PCMH and New York State Medicaid is paying $8 per member per month. So the extra staff they need to, you know, follow through on the implementation is now paid for, at least in the Medicaid practices, just on a per member per month because the state has recognized the importance of paying for the infrastructure behind it. But the critical issue is, is the statement, before we will bring anything to the practice, we'll, we'll not say you just have to do more with less. That doesn't work very well. Here are the efficiencies. As you pointed out, 
Jim, looking at that point of care tool, that saves an awful lot of time that the MOAs, <laughs> in fact, we had better uptake with the point of care tool with the MOAs almost than we had with the doctors. The MOAs and our nurses really loved it because, you know, they gave the flu shot, the Pneumovax, they got everything done, and it was all there in front of them without having to wait for the doctor to order it. So we got really good uptake by the office staff. So the, the school itself was valuable. <laughs> Great. Um, well, thank you both so much. I'm going to um, end with just a quick announcement. Um, we have our next session on April 7th uh, with uh, Dr. Nancy Elder on qualitative methods and multi-method research. And then we have a, a second uh, seminar on April 21st. So we have two during the month of April. Um, so please make note of that on your calendar if you haven't already. Um, and I want to thank again our, our presenters today, Dr. Chet Fox and Dr. Mary Delansky, for this very uh, uh, insightful and, and beneficial seminar to all of us on quality improvement, quality improvement research. So, so thank you very much. Um, I think we're out of time for today, so we're going to we're going to sign off. Uh, again, appreciate so much you presenting today um, and uh, uh, spending time to prepare and present to our fellows. Okay. Everyone have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.